This chicken lived 18 months without its head. People from all over the country flocked to see him and he earned his owner exorbitant sums of money despite him initially wanting to roast the chicken. Mike would say hi to you, but he has no tongue. He also has no eyes to see you, nor does he have ears. Well, he had one ear, but still. So you're probably thinking this is just clickbait and the image is photoshopped? It's not. Mike really did exist. And his story began on September 10th, 1945. Lloyd Olson, a farmer from Colorado, talked to his wife and she told him her mother would be coming for dinner. The couple decided to make a chicken dinner. So Lloyd went to the coop and captured Mike. Little did they know, Mike was a very lucky chicken. Even though the axe removed Mike's face clean off, it missed the jugular vein, leaving the brain stem and one ear intact. Mike was still alive. The farmer couldn't bear to see him suffer any further, so he grabbed the chicken and cared for him like never before. Every day, Lloyd fed him a mix of milk and water via an eyedropper. He gave Mike grains of corn and worms, and Lloyd soon realized he could make money from Mike's condition. Mike toured the country, and people paid good money to see the headless chicken in real life. Lloyd earned $4,500 per month, the equivalent of $54,610 in 2021, and every year there's an annual Mike the Headless Chicken Day held in May in Fruta, Colorado, followed by a red crab migration. David Attenborough said that encountering the millions of red crabs migrating annually on Australia's Christmas Island is one of his favorite TV moments. Every spring, thousands upon thousands of crabs migrate from their home on Christmas Island to the ocean. To protect the red crabs, they close off entire roads. They hire cleaning crews that smash that like button, just like you should do if you haven't done so already. But no, in all seriousness, the cleaning crews remove the crabs with rakes when there's incoming traffic, and they've even built bridges for the crabs to use to cross the road. First, the males will embark on the journey, and the timing and speed of the migration will be determined by the phase of the moon. The females follow, and they mate at sea. The males then leave, and the females lay the eggs and tend to them until hatching. Finally, once the babies reach 5 millimeters across, they begin crawling inland and hopefully find their parents. Next up, we have the Narcisse snakes. Located just 3.7 miles, 6 kilometers north of Narcisse, Manitoba, in the rural municipality of Armstrong, the Narcisse snake dens are the winter home of thousands upon thousands of red-sided garter snakes. During the winter months, they live in the local caverns, comprised of limestone bedrock which was formed from the water in the area. Locals won't have much problem with the snakes in the winter, but come springtime, these snakes, literally heaps of snakes, come out of their dens looking to mate. They'll spread out and hide in the nearby marshes getting ready for summer. People have organized tours and the site is open to the public, but we would never advise you to go there alone. The most popular times to visit, if this is your thing, would be in April or May during the mating season and then in September when the snakes return to their dens. If you're like us and wouldn't like to step foot near the Narcee snakes, comment snakes are a no-go in the comments section below. And now come 20 tons of herring. Unfortunately, this one wasn't pickled. During the New Year's Eve celebration of January 1st, 2012, the shores of Norway were flooded with about 20 tons of dead herring. Locals immediately thought back to the 1980s when something similar happened in the country, but before they could investigate what happened to the herring, they disappeared, leaving Norwegian scientists perplexed because now they had two unanswered questions – why the fish appeared and why they died. Don't forget about the African drongo. The fork-tailed drongo, or the African drongo, is a small black omnivorous bird that lives in the tropical regions of Africa. But why are they interesting? The fork-tailed drongo can mimic the sounds of many other birds and even mammals, like meerkats. This comes in particularly handy when times are tough and they can't find food, or when they don't want to hunt. In that case, when the drongo sees a group of meerkats capturing a prey, the bird will mimic the sound of a big predator, and the meerkats will immediately flee, leaving their food behind. Once they're gone, the drongo will swoop in and take their catch. And then we have the Thai monkeys. Because there were far fewer people offering these monkeys food during the lockdown, some locals saw a group of them fighting and clawing their way to a pot of yogurt. The city of Lopburi in northeast Bangkok was famous for its monkey population, but there were no tourists in town and there was no one to feed them. 
So thousands upon thousands of them could be seen roaming the streets, blocking traffic, and causing problems wherever they went. What about the Arkansas bird rain? On New Year's Eve 2010, between 4 and 5,000 blackbirds were found in the ground in Wynwood, Arkansas. Locals feared that some virus or disease was spreading in their town, so they immediately reported the event to the authorities. Three laboratories sent in researchers, and they took samples of the dead birds. They realized that the cause of death was blunt force trauma. In simple terms, that means these four to 5,000 birds crashed into a wall or some other blunt object while flying and died. But that seems rather unlikely, no? Of course it does. But when you take into account the population of 1.6 million blackbirds in the town and the fireworks that scared a million birds in the middle of the night, they have poor vision, so crashing into a wall during the night isn't too hard to imagine. Next comes the toad explosion of 2005. In 2005, toads in Germany and Denmark started exploding during mating season. Blood, guts, and skin were everywhere. These unpleasant sights baffled scientists, so they began an investigation. For months, none of the scientists could determine the cause of their sudden death, except for Dr. Frank Munchman, an amphibian expert. He observed the toads and concluded that each had a circular incision on its back, each was missing the liver, and none of them had any other scratch marks. The size of the hole was roughly the size of a bird's beak. Knowing how smart crows are, he theorized that the crows picked out the liver, which was not poisonous, and when the toads swelled up as a defense, nothing could hold their organs inside and pop. We also have cotton candy trees from hell. Why did people like the cotton candy trees from hell? Well, to answer that, we have to go back to the summer of 2010. While the rest of the world was going to the beach, in Pakistan, the beach came to the people. Massive floods covered the land, and it took the water six months to recede. 20 million of the locals had to move, but they weren't the only ones. The spiders were running from the water as well. Floating on the surface of the water, the spiders started climbing trees, hoping to save themselves. But the water was there to stay for the next six months. Trying to survive, the spiders started building cocoons in the trees, and here you can see what these spiders did with the trees in Sindh, Pakistan. The locals didn't mind. This had happened before, and they were used to it. In fact, the people liked it. They might look scary, but the locals knew the spiders would capture and eat the mosquitoes in the flooded area. This meant one thing and one thing only. Malaria in the region would drastically drop. These cotton candy trees from hell act like big mosquito nets. Of course, we now have murmurations. The European starling is a very common bird, but their murmurations baffled biologists for centuries. They flock together, sometimes in the hundreds of thousands, and they fly in an eerily illusionistic way. In the 1930s, Edmund Sellis thought that these birds were used to communicate with one another, and the shape of their murmurations sent a particular message. Later, in the 1950s, after several studies, scientists concluded that this was nothing more than a fast response to the movement of the other birds in the flock. It seems like the book Thought Transference or What in Birds by Sellis was a waste of time. YouTube thinks you should watch this video next.